Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. We start another interesting two-part series today as we discuss some common mistakes in the M&A space. To help us do that, we have with us on the show Toby Tester from Beyond the Deal. In this series, Toby talks to us about the M&A Failure Club and how you can avoid being one of their members, as it is, quite frankly, a fairly easy club to join. We also talk about this interesting concept of the deal fever, what it is and how not to catch it. And then in part two of the series, we also talk about zombie acquirers, how to avoid them and how to not to be one. So trust me when I say that the next two weeks with Toby will be a whole lot of fun and very educating. So let's jump right in. Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area. And hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Thank you so much, Toby, for coming along today to talk about the common mistakes and how to avoid them. Firstly, I just have to say I have to credit the title of today's podcast to you, Don't Join the M&A Failure Club. I think this is a fabulous title, Toby. You're very creative, clearly. Well, to be honest, it's I don't, I'm not sure about creativity. I, I have actually seen that before and I thought, that's a great title. And I thought, <laughs> let's, let's use it on this occasion. I love it. I love it. I really like it. The m and Failure Club. I really want to drill into this. It's heavily loaded, just a few words, but there's a lot in it, a lot that I really want to drill into. But first, I, I just thought it might help to set the scene a little bit. Maybe if you could give a really quick background of who you are and what you do, just so that, you know, our listeners can get a bit of context to what we're talking about today. Okay. Well, first of all, my name is uh, Toby Tester, and I think you probably sort of gained from my accent that I originally came from the UK. (laughs) That's where I came from. And look, just with regards to the whole merger and acquisition discipline, it's something that I've been involved in for about the last 17 years of my career. I started off life as an engineer, moved into banking and finance working for some major banks around the world. And then after that, moved into M&A. And I've been focusing on this, as I said, for about 17 years. It's a fascinating exercise, fascinating um, area. And I have seen plenty of success, but also failure too. You know, when we were talking the other day, I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting in what we were discussing was your comment, which I completely agree with, that often you can learn a lot more from the failures or the things that go wrong than perhaps the success stories albeit I have a feeling today you're going to tell us there's not a a hell of a lot of success stories, but. (laughs) Yeah, well, in actual fact, I remember hearing someone else saying that in actual fact, there's two things in life. You either succeed or you learn. Right. I like that. Failure is really just an opportunity to learn. It it happens. And obviously, uh, as we see others um, struggling, especially with M&A, sometimes it's like the proverbial bar of soap in the shower. (laughs) sometimes rather hard to grab hold of. But it's important to understand, you know, when you are successful in holding that soap, but also times when you drop it and you think, well, what can I learn from that? Yeah, great. I love it. And look, before we get past your background and your history, I just have to ask you about a couple of things that I'm extremely interested in. Aerospace. You started off your (laughs) study in aerospace, really? Well, yes, I did. My original degree actually was in aerospace, so my very, very first job was actually writing software for flight simulators. Wow. So I actually wrote software that went into flight simulators where pilots, you know, people who are learning to fly for commercial aircraft, they they would do it in simulators first. And so they would fly these simulators using the software that I'd written to effectively um, to practice and to obviously gain their qualifications so they can indeed uh, fly, you know, commercial aircraft. That is so fascinating. And now tell me, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to find an answer to this, but here's a tricky one. Where's the crossover between aerospace and (laughs) (laughs) M&A? Well, I'll say, look, it's a deeper one. Perhaps I can explain this one. Fundamentally, I'm an engineer. My background is um, fundamentally around engineering, which engineering, quite frankly, is often described as like mathematics applied. 
is the application of maths, uh, but also rational, clear thought processes intending to design something that will work in practice. And when I look at M&A, I look at M&A at a very objective process, which consists of a, of a series of steps which you can indeed engineer, ultimately lead to success. So I take a very rational engineering mindset to the way M&A is done. So I strip out the emotion. I look at the objectives of what you need to do, look at the stepping stones and how to engineer those stepping stones towards what is ultimate success for an M&A deal. That's amazing. What a fabulous answer to that. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting question. I love it. I love it, Toby. That's really, it's really interesting. And and, you, you know, I think it's great because it gives us a really good background and perspective on some of these things that we're going to talk about today, I think. And then I've just got one other question for you. I saw in your bio that you're an accredited Prince 2 practitioner. Take us through that. What does that mean? Well, actually, in the project management world, there are two well-known project management methodologies um, out there. One is the something called PIMBOK or the Project Management Institute, which is a broad uh, set of steps that you take when you're project managing something. Then the other one is something called PRINCE. PRINCE stands for Projects in a Controlled Environment. Uh Uh-huh. Nothing to do with the singer. Uh Uh-huh. Got it. No. (laughs) Got nothing to do with Machiavelli. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, there, I thought this was going to lead into some very interesting questions. But <laughs> no, no, you thought I was somehow, what, a, a devotee of Prince or a devotee of Machiavelli? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay, great, Toby. All right. Well, how about we talk then a, a bit more about the fabulous title of our podcast today, which is Don't Join the M&A Failure Club. <laughs> what is a failure? You know, I um I thought this was, a, to me, this was a really catchy title, particularly because, of course, it suggests that there's quite a large club out there of failures of m and As. How do we work out whether, you know, a merger or an acquisition is, in fact, a failure? What does that mean? Well, it's an, it's an interesting point. And, uh, you know, you did highlight that the M&A Failure Club, you unfortunately do have a lot of unwitting businesses out there who find themselves joining this club. <laughs> it's not one you really want to join. <laughs> and yet, entry is so easy into this club. So how can you enter this failure club? Well, I think perhaps the best way to do it is to think of it on the flip side. Uh, Think about success. And look, success is obviously a subjective. um, Sometimes people see it as a subjective. They'll say, well, we did this. And yes, it was success. It was all great. But didn't drill down any further. But let me just drill down just a little bit about what success is. And I'll divide success into three major sort of areas. One is strategic success. In other words, was the deal done? Did it achieve its strategic goals that you set out right at the very beginning? Was that achieved? The next uh, criteria for success is financial success, which is an obvious one. In other words, did it deliver shareholder value? Did it create a return on investment? Did it actually achieve the uh, profit forecast? So there's a number of different goals. Did it achieve those goals? And then the third criteria of success is operational success. In other words, have you achieved what you wanted to do at a deep down operational level so that ultimately, regardless of the market conditions or whatever, this business has got a long-term future to it. And the long-term future comes down to having good operations. Were those operational goals achieved? And so I say, was it strategically successful, financially successful, or operationally successful? And those are the three key areas of success and, of course, flip side of failure. And, Joanna, look, if I can just do and I'm going to shout some statistics to you just to give you a sense of how big this M&A failure club is. I'll point, and I've, done, I've read lots and lots of surveys. They're done all the time around the world asking a number of uh, executives these key questions. I'll point to one, and it was actually a 2017 survey, so it's quite recent, by PricewaterhouseCoopers. And they asked hundreds of executives who had deal, did deals, was the acquisition a strategic success? And 55% said yes. Mm-hmm. 
45%, therefore, it wasn't seen as a strategic success. Same question for financial success. Did you achieve your financial goals with your acquisition? And then the survey response was 50% said yes, 50% said no. Wow, even to financial success. Even financial. So this is an interesting thing. And now here we are, 2017, we are finding that M&A sometimes can be the biggest investment a business will ever make. The odds of success is no better than a coin toss. Wow. That we have to highlight this quote, I think, Toby, in this in this podcast. That's <laughs> <laughs> that that's definitely a tweetable quote, as we say. <laughs> when you put it in that light, that's really huge. That it's uh, it's no better than a coin toss, and certainly a lot harder. <laughs> exactly. Now, I don't want to think of M and A as like taking a trip down to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to think that when you're spending biggest investment, discretion investment you're ever going to make, that you want to have really good odds for success. You know that it can't be 100%. You know there's always going to be variables. But a coin toss? Come on. It's got to be better than that. Yeah, absolutely. And look, out of these three areas, strategic, financial, operational, what do you think, uh, I mean, it, it sounds obvious that maybe organisations clearly aren't looking at each of these areas in enough detail for the statistics to reveal what you've just talked about now. Which of these areas generally do you feel organisations are looking at when they're contemplating a deal as the most important? You know, I'm guessing financial, but I'd be interested to hear what you say here. Well, obviously, out of those three, I'd say financial is obviously paramount, and so it should be. Ultimately, we need to look at how a business is valued, making sure there's the appropriate evaluation exercise that is done. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more, actually, about you know where valuation issues, there are valuation mistakes that are made. But valuation is absolutely key to this to achieve the financial success. And I think the big mistake with strategic success is understanding very much where this deal actually fits. So if we are saying that I'm going to buy this business, then you've got to say, well, strategically, how do these two businesses fit together? It's a really fundamental question. And it really comes down to how do we fit together in terms of our markets? How do we fit together in terms of the customers we fit together? How do we fit together in terms of our operations and our systems? And so it's making sure there's proper deal fit. And there's a common term out there known as capabilities. In other words, when you have um, people like myself talking about M&A and, and strategy, we often talk about what are the capabilities that you have as an acquirer and what are the capabilities that you want to have that you don't currently have that you want to have. And so it's important to see that from a strategic point of view so that all those capabilities do add up to something that's greater than what you've currently got. Well, obviously, we, we've talked about the fact that an acquisition may be one of the biggest investments an organisation makes, or, or indeed, if they're on the path of many multiple acquisitions and the totality of those acquisitions are, are one of their biggest investments. And we all know acquisitions take time, energy and resources. So if an organisation is going down the path of an acquisition, why is it that they were failing in these areas, strategic, financial, operational? One would assume there would be a lot of attention applied to what success looks like from the beginning, but clearly not. Clearly not. No, indeed. Let me explain this one. And I'm going to give you the really, really big mistakes. Okay. And I think when I say this, I think people hopefully will be nodding and agreeing to this one. And I'd say one of the very first mistakes, I think, as we go through this whole deal process is something called deal fever. It's an ailment or it's a certain condition executives find themselves getting in is when getting the deal done is all that matters. In other words, basically, they're thinking deal completion is all that matters, but not necessarily deal success. Deal completion does not mean deal success. And I think deal fever is contagious as well within an organization, right? It is very <laughs> contagious. And if you have someone who has deal fever, that fever will start spreading. And so what we need is an antidote to that deal fever. And the antidote, and it's a very simple one, really, is simply just making sure that when we go through this whole M&A process, making sure we have clearly mapped it out as a process. In other words, there really are very clear steps 
objective thought and clear processes that we go through. So we go from one step to another step to another step to another step. And don't suddenly leapfrog over all sorts of steps because of this fever. I think the biggest thing is deal fever is our biggest problem. And the answer to it, the antidote, is to make sure we have objective thought and a clear process and governance around it. Mm, I think that's a really good point. I was actually just having this discussion just yesterday with an organisation that has been approached to be uh, acquired for a very substantial sum for this organisation. And they were, we were talking about this massive due diligence list that they had received. Even though it was a, it's a sizable sale. It was, you know, sometimes we see these DD lists that are out of control. Absolutely, I've seen, I've seen them all the time. Yep. Yeah, and sometimes what happens there is, I feel that when you're dealing with DD lists like this, sometimes you lose the wood for the trees. But anyway, you know, they, and certainly this wasn't a um, a tailored list for the organisation that was receiving it. But they were talking about a discussion that they had with another organisation that had previously been acquired by the prospective buyer who had also received the same DD list and started studiously working through it. And the buyer had this deal fever that you're describing and halfway through said, well, no, hold on, it's taking too long for us, you know, to, for you to get all that information. Don't worry about the DD list, let's just move it on. And I guess here is an, ex- <laughs> an absolute example of the problems, number one, of having um, a requirement that isn't tailored to the organisations that you're looking at purchasing, right? But number two, when deal fever hits and all sensible thought goes out the window in order to get the deal done Correct. In, in a quick time. And I think, Joanna, just going back on your point on the DD list is that, yes, look, I've seen these big DD lists too. I'm not a big fan of lists. I know they're important, but I think they do need to cover all areas of a business, not just the financial, the legal, but also the people aspect as well. Make sure that the appropriate people and culture assessment is done. But I think above all of this is that the whole idea of DD is really to find out where are the key risks. So it's important that those risks are truly spotted they're highlighted, but also how you're going to deal with them. In other words, how you're going to deal with them during that whole deal process, but also afterwards. So if there's a a certain market risk, perhaps, then let's highlight it and say, what does this highlight? Is this a a deal breaker? Maybe not. Okay, how are we going to manage it afterwards? But making sure that there's a clear risk management strategy and plan. Mm, Absolutely. Which really requires, I guess, careful thought in the beginning about the relevant aspects of this deal, you know. And sometimes I find I just, it annoys me sometimes when I see cookie cutter approaches because I feel like there's a lot of wasted time, but also people get focused on the wrong things. That's right. And I think it comes down to the cookie cutter approach sometimes is a kind of a crutch that I think sometimes people who probably haven't had a lot of acquisitions or or, or sales under their belt, and they, they fall back on that. But I think it's a case that, look, it's necessary. I think cookie cutter or, you know, templates and the like um, are all good. But I think it's experience and having passed through the fire is actually finding out where the real issues are. And I think that comes down to delving into these common mistakes. And I, once again, deal fever. Are we actually stepping over the process and tripping up ourselves and not gone through an objective, thoughtful process? And that's a problem. And so it's important that, yes, cookie cutters, we've got to have that sort of thing. But as experience tells you where you need to look specifically on any one deal. Mm, don't let it replace the thought process, I guess. That's the point, right? Yes. Don't let it replace thinking. Let's take a short break. When we get back, Toby continues down his list of common mistakes which can unwittingly make you a member of the M&A Failure Club. He talks about the important role of boards in acting as moderators for M&A deals and the value of getting yourself educated about the best practices in the industry. And that's next. I'm Joanna Oki and you're listening to The Deal Room Podcast, brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. interested in hearing smart legal tips for business, the Deal Room sister podcast, Talking Law, is perfect for you. These two podcasts are now among the top legal podcasts in Australia. In our Talking Law podcast, 
I dissect a different topic each week that I have seen impact businesses, and I then provide actionable tips for you to avoid that risk or to use that legal area to your advantage. We release new episodes every 10 days, and you can listen to our episodes through www.talkinglaw.com.au or subscribe to our Talking Law podcast on iTunes to be the first to know when a new episode is out. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. Earlier, we got to know Toby, his unique background in aerospace and engineering, and the fascinating connection between these two fields to Toby's approach in mergers and acquisitions. We also talked about the three key areas for success in M&A transactions, strategic, financial and operational. Toby also warned us about the deal fever and how we can avoid catching it. Now, let's jump back to our conversation with Toby and talk about two more common mistakes that can unwittingly make you a member of the M&A Failure Club. Okay, so deal fever. I completely agree with that one. So I'm excited to hear what number two is, Toby. What's number two? Oh, dear. Okay. (laughs) Boards. I think sometimes boards are not acting as moderators. So I think it's important that, and this comes down to avoidance of deal fever again, but I think it's for the boards themselves not to see themselves as rubber stamps, but to be the ones who are indeed the final arbiters, who do have the final say and do approve the deal. In other words, it's not a management exercise per se. I think boards need to be actively involved in any m and deal to be fully across it, understanding the risks, but also to make sure that we are indeed following a proper process. And so how do they do that? Because the issue for boards is that there's a lot for them to be considering all the time. Often it's very hard for them to get into the detail of anything, really. So what's the approach that you recommend following to make this achievable practically? Well, I think boards primarily are a governing body. And so what they need to do is to ask, first of all, What is the governance process that we are applying over this deal? In other words, how did we come to select a certain number of targets? How do we approve what those targets are? That's the board to do. Then it's a case of the next stage gate, you know, a point at which you go back to the board and say, board, here's here's the transaction information around a particular deal. Here are the key summary of points. Let's go sit down together and actually approve the next step. So it comes down to actively involving them. But above all, it is a governance exercise. And so the board needs to be applying that governance process to the deal. Okay, I like that one. All right. Um, and then what's number three? Oh, number three. <laughs> now, this is another one. It's not following best practice. Now, this comes back down to deal fever again. Now, let's be honest. There are indeed thousands of deals happening around the world all the time. Okay, this is a major exercise for investment where any organization is looking for inorganic growth. There is a lot of good practice out there. Books have been written about this, a lot of information on how to do valuations, how to do diligence, how to actually um, progress a deal, how to integrate a deal out there. Lots of great best practice. Basically, read up on it, understand what these best practices are, and don't let highly aggressive timelines run roughshod over best practice. So you're talking about the education in terms of best practice. Yeah. People involved need to get educated. I think so. I think M&A is a well-disciplined exercise. There's a lot of literature. There's a lot written out there. Don't run it on the seat of your pants. Much has been written, said, uh, written on this topic. There is a lot of good practices out there. I would say follow them. If you can think of any off the top of your head, what are your top tips here for people who are wanting to get a bit more educated about best practice to go and read or look at? Well, okay, that's, that's a good question. First of all, the Australian Institute of Company Directors, they actually do run courses on this topic and they also have events on this as well. So for directors, I think that's a great place to go. They're always running courses and they always have an event which they're running with, you know, seminar on this very topic and, and the role of directors. For executives, 
I'd say that there are many articles written, I'd say, first of all, by the uh, major accounting firms. So um, PwC, um, Ernst & Young, Deloitte uh, uh, and the like have written many articles on, on those best practices. And then I'd say for uh, accountants, I'd say that there is, um, going back to, say, for example, the Australian Institute of Chartered Accounting, they also have seminars, they have also training events around M&A and particularly around valuation. And of course, we should say and listen to this podcast. I think we should add that in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> That closes part one of our exciting two-part series with Toby Tester of Beyond the Deal. As a quick recap, today we open the series by getting to know Toby and his unique background in aerospace engineering and how these fields influence the systematic approach that Toby takes on merger and acquisition deals. Toby then identified the three key areas in assessing whether an M&A deal was successful or not. These are strategic, financial and operational aspects of the transaction. Then he introduced us to the common disease that's infected members of the M&A Failure Club, what he calls deal fever. Toby also talked about the importance of having the board actively involved in M&A transactions, acting as moderators of every single deal. And finally, we closed part one with a discussion on how to get educated in this area. There's definitely a wealth of resources available for buyers, sellers and advisors in this space that provide some best practices that you can adopt to help membership in the M&A Failure Club be avoided. In fact, I launched this podcast to do exactly that, to help all stakeholders in a business sale and purchase get the best possible deal. At Aspect Legal, we offer a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition and to get transaction ready. We also have a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We also provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Also, if you'd like to get a copy of the transcript to this episode, then head over to thedealroompodcast.com and look for this episode, episode 30. We hope you enjoyed our first half hour with Toby. Stand by for part two next Tuesday or, of course, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes to be the first to know when a new episode is out. Thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and The Deal Room Podcast. Brought to you by the commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 